5.3 on inclusive knowledge production for effective development cooperation. I'm Professor Shailaja Fennell, Professor of Regional Transformation at the University of Cambridge, and we have four excellent papers that are going to interrogate the whole field of aid in relation to thinking of aid as a form of cooperation and how different forms of knowledge construction and production affect the process. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Rekha Bangankar from the Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge, who will be speaking on can social learning support adaptive expectation, groundwater governance from semi-arid India. Over to you, Rekha. Can social learning support adaptive management uh, of groundwater, and this especially in the context of semi-arid regions in India? So to give you a little context about importance of groundwater to India. India is home to nearly 17% of the world's population. In terms of its access to freshwater resources, it only has 4.5%. This puts her in a place of being the largest user of groundwater in the world. Groundwater satisfies nearly 85% of the rural drinking water requirements in India, and a similar figure for the urban population is about 45%. Groundwater is also important for development of agriculture in the country. Uh, it contributes to nearly 60% of the irrigation requirement and is also a necessary resource to drought-proof agriculture in the semi-arid and arid regions of the country. Now, to give you a little more importance about a context about the importance of groundwater for agriculture in particular, of the total cultivated land in India, it's only 40% that has been brought under irrigated cultivation. And as I mentioned earlier, nearly 60% of this irrigated land is supplied by groundwater. Now, the Green Revolution technology swept the country in 1960s and 70s, and successful adoption of tube belt technology was attributed as a reason for success of Green Revolution in the country. Farmers also seem to have a preference for groundwater-based irrigation systems over surface water irrigation systems because they are more efficient. Efficient in the sense that the access to resources individual as well as more dependable. So the, the cream of this is that groundwater development is very, very essential to agricultural development in the country. Now, to give you a little context about the study region that we are working on. So we have chosen the state of Maharashtra. It's a state located on the western side of the country. Now, why we chose the state of Maharashtra is because historically, this is the state that has received the highest share of public investment in irrigation development. Yet only a third of the cultivated land in the region is irrigated leaving the rest to rain-fed farming conditions. Though agriculture does not contribute significantly to the state domestic product, what you can see is that 55% of the population in the state is dependent on agriculture. And many of them, as much as 80% of them, are smallholding farmers. As you can see from the map, much of the agricultural land in land in Maharashtra is classified under semi-arid or semi-arid conditions, and because of increasing climate risks, particularly the variability in rainfall and rising temperature, agricultural livelihoods are very vulnerable. And the way to overcome this vulnerability is to bring in more land under irrigation. Now, then the question is, how do we develop the irrigation potential of semi-arid regions? And a development intervention that has been very popular since the 2000s is to harvest the annual seasonal rainfall, use that rainfall to recharge groundwater tables. Now, with the recharge groundwater tables, more land can be brought under irrigated cultivation. This improves farm income as well as secures the farm income. Now, micro watershed development is one of the flagship program which practices this concept. Uh, to define a micro watershed, it is a landscape between 500 hectares to about 1,000 hectares, typically sitting between a village or a two in the Indian context, and particularly in the context of Maharashtra. It is a, it is a smallest possible hydrogeological unit such that all the water that falls on that piece of land 
will dra drain through a common point. And this hydrogeological property is used to plan soil and water conservation measures, thereby to increase the potential to harvest seasonal rainfall and recharge groundwater tables. Now, what we also see is in on the map that you have on the left side, you can see that it's a, it's a picture of a micro watershed where percolation tanks, so the harvested water is brought to a percolation tank, channeled to a percolation tank, and that percolation tank is used to recharge groundwater tables. And then some other spaces, like the one that on the left side, uh, the structure used there is a check dam. So check dam is used to harvest rainfall and recharge groundwater tables. So this is again an example of what magic watershed development programs can do. So the picture on the right, you can see it's the initial stage of uh, afforestation activities as well as soil and water conservation activities. So terraces have been constructed. And in about five to seven years, you can achieve this green space that, is, that you can see on the right side. Uh, and of course, this is dependent on how well the community is able to use norms, exercise norms of ban on open grazing as well as afforestation. And you also see in, the, in this image, the percolation tanks, which are the central points for harvesting, uh, harvesting rainfall as well as recharging groundwater tables. So the outcome of this development intervention is that farmers do invest more in invest in wells. They have reason to invest in wells now. They also invest in the new system of farm ponds. These farm ponds are basically large storage tanks which can store millions of liters of water uh, and primarily used to secure irrigation, secure irrigation, particularly expecting a future shortfall in rainfall. So in the semi-arid regions, we also see that a mixed agriculture is the dominant form of agriculture. This is the way farmers, um, mac some farmers mitigate risks. So land is shared between certain crops that are more water consumptive and certain which are not very water consumptive. And this is the typical less water consumptive commercial crops that are grown are cotton, lentils, and millets. And depending on the irrigation potential that each farmland ha has, farmers also subject a part of their land to cultivation of high value commercial crops such as grapes. Grapes is the most popular one in this region. But the challenge is that how do we sustain this kind of an agricultural development process? And this is, this is primarily coming from the fact that groundwater is a common pool resource, which means that, yes, this resource is able to increase income for farmers, generate more farm income, but it is a resource that is shared. And with more and more people accessing the resource, less is left. And it is also very difficult to exclude somebody from this consumption of groundwater particularly in the case of India, because the land rights and water rights are together in the sense that there is no separation. Anybody who owns a piece of land also is entitled to draw water beneath it. As a consequence, the news article on the right says that this is a man which who, who owns about 48 bore wells, yet cannot meet his irrigation requirements. And this is a representative of the region that we are studying. So the argument then is, is there a potential for social learning to really navigate or to structure groundwater, demand for groundwater in the semi-arid regions? Because, because, because uh, navigating or controlling or having more sustainability thoughts built into demand management of groundwater-based irrigation is necessary for the sustainability of this resource. The framework that we use is the socio-ecological systems framework by Eleanor Rostrom. And the choice of this framework is because uh, Eleanor's, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's framework focuses on the role of communities in management of common pool resources. So, and also, we are focusing on the potential of social learning in better groundwater management because literature also suggests that there is potential for social learning to shape demand management in semi arid regions. So, tools such as water budgeting tools field games to highlight the commonness of groundwater, and even training community, community volunteers to measure the amount of recharge and use of groundwater has all been seen as successful and effective, manage, effective way of managing groundwater demand. 
So because we are concerned with the idea of social learning, the question is how do we how do we construct the idea of social learning in more empirical sense? So we use the social network theorem as our basis, and we lay out the social network in the community with the assumption that all the learning, social learning that is taking place in the community is through the social networks. To operationalize this concept, we engaged in discussions with every farmer in the community and asked them whether they discuss the matters of agriculture with friends and, friends and families in the community, and if so, could they name at least a few. And based on that information, we mapped the social network in the community, and then de devising a score for that social network, we analyzed the causal relationship between how um, how that social learning and the social learning that taking place, social learning that takes place through that social network is invest is influencing investment in irrigation practices. So this is an this is a, a this is a representation of how farmers in the community are connected. So the all the farmers in the villages are plotted here. All the little red dots that you see are farmers in this community. And the bigger the size of the dot you see are farmers who are influencers in communities. So even agricultural extension use these influencers as a means to bring in new ideas of development, new ideas of irrigation practices in the community. Uh, what you see in this particular community is that there is clearly a leadership model of influencers. There are a few farmers who are the influencers in the community, but because they are very, because they are very well integrated as a community, any adaptive practices, again, any new practices that these few, in, few influencers will uh, incorporate in their agricultural practices is very quickly diffused and learned by others in the community. So to hold all the arguments together, the main point that we are highlighting is that it is for groundwater to be sustainably used in the community, it is necessary that there is an effective management of irrigation demand and this space is controlled by social learning. Social learning influences not only the farm level practices of irrigation management, but also the ability of the community to enforce and value resource use norms in the community. Now here, how do we establish the social, so establish social learning as a factor influencing irrigation demand? We are particularly modeling how Farm ponds, it is a new uh, infrastructure that has been made very popular by the state government since, since 2015. And we are seeing that the social learning has been a critical compo component influencing uh, investments of farmers at the farm level, and particularly in farm ponds. So we use a truncated regression model, and we use a truncated regression model because there are some in the community who have been able to invest in farm ponds, but some who haven't. And what we see is that social learning, and here computed in terms of betweenness, is an important factor that determines irrigation management at the farm level. So to conclude, among many other factors considered in the causal relation, uh, betweenness or the social learning that is there in the community is a significant factor influencing irrigation management practices. Irrigation, it influences irrigation management practices both at the farm level as well as at the community level. Social learning, but what we also see is that social learning encourages private provisioning of irrigation in the community. So this is a trick situation because on one side, social learning is required, to enforce, required for enforcement of resource use norms in the community. What we also see on the other side is social learning is encouraging more of private provisioning of irrigation. Social learning from the social network fostered the idea of community ownership of groundwater. Groundwater in this context was all, always referred to as our water. The community did feel the commonness of groundwater. However, it is seen more in terms of a private provisioning. So to conclude, yes, there is enough potential in social learning to shape irrigation management practices in the community. However, 
this is when we have to focus on what kind of technology for irrigation management practices are introduced in the community because the technology and the ability to harvest water, ability to use water will also de determine the ability of the communities to enforce resource use norm. And together, they will result in effective management of groundwater. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rekha. Over to you, Albert. Apologies, is this the clicker, please, Erica? Let's give this a try. There we are. Um, so today's uh, talk is actually, it's, it's a nice follow-up to the um, issue of social learning in the context of rural farmers, because uh, I'm looking at, in a way, it's a form of social learning, but instead of rural farmers looking more towards the ivory towers. So to what extent can academics and experts on a particular policy space, in this case, resilience policy in the context of sustainable development, actually learn from each other? And uh, these go hand in hand, I would argue, because these ideas, these discourses, these policy narratives often come to shape the policies encountered by the farmers uh, in, in Dr. Bangalka's case. So uh, I realize it may sound rather abstract, but I'd like to emphasize that this sort of inclusive uh, participation at the level of knowledge production itself is, is something I'd stress as quite important in understanding development uh, efficacy today. So um, the first part, we'll just take a look at this concept of resilience for any of you who may find the word rather ambiguous or foreign. Um, and then we'll get into some of the implications, some of the opportunities and challenges. So to give a bit of context, um, resilience has made quite a big boom in the policy space and development. And if you haven't encountered it already, you might at least have heard the word in, in your respective areas of research. So here's just a, a Nature Climate uh, paper on changing the resilience paradigm. This is 2014. Uh, this is from the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction on the Resilience Paradigm, Facts for Transformation. This is 2018. Um, this is from Project Syndicate. Uh, actually, this year, just a few months ago, the new resilience paradigm. You know, so just really announcing this presence of this concept of resilience as a major new imperative or initiative, right? But my question is, well, actually, is there really a paradigm? You know, people keep on saying we talk about resilience, resilience is important, but what do we actually mean when we talk about resilience? And that's the basic question I started off with. Because this is um, a quick bibliometric sort of uh, canvas of the last, uh, oh gosh, 30 years or so. Um, taking a look, this is development studies journals on Web of Science and the presence of resilience policy in development studies journals. And you can see that business has been booming for resilience over the last few years, right? So if we, if we go right into this concept of resilience itself, I mean, it's got quite a long history behind it. It's uh, coming from multiple disciplinary uh, routes, ecology, engineering, psychology. So in the context of engineering, we might find resilience emphasized as a measure of strength, but as opposed to hardness, it's more about flexibility, uh, about toughness, if you will. Um, if engineering is concerned about mechanical failures, then uh, ecology is looking more at extinction, right? So there's a landmark paper by Holling in 1973 that uh, sort of launches this concept of resilience in the ecology space back in a prior era when sustainability was a very big issue. Uh, but it's often very, very, very much paraphrased as a concept of jumping back. So the ability of a system to jump back. And this system can be any sort of system, but it's usually characterized by complexity both in its internal composition and in terms of its risks. And I should just mention that um, in addition to this concept of being able to jump back to a status quo or to a prior state, there are also new conceptions of resilience as the ability to jump forward, to proactively adapt to unknown, complex, unknowable risks. Now, what's interesting is that when we actually take a look at how resilience is used in the development studies literature, specifically on the policy-oriented works, there is a fair consensus that resilience is a good thing, right? There's a fairly clear moral or normative orientation at play. 
Uh, the, the one notable exception is when resilience is applied to political subjects, where often resilience is at attached to, you know, resilient authoritarianism, resilient neoliberalism, resilient rentier states. But if we go back to its commonalities, there is this very useful emphasis on resilience as a means to tackle complexity in our present day. And I'd argue that this is perhaps one of the reasons why resilience is as popular as it is. It, it, it addresses, it recognizes the complexity and the unpredictability of the development challenges that we face. And this encompasses both complex risks, so situations where it's, you're not just working with known knowns, it, it becomes very difficult to model contexts when, you know, your, the relevant variables you should be measuring in the first place are unknowable, right? Or when those variables might fundamentally change across contexts, across time and space. Um, and these are often divided across shocks and stresses. So shocks, short-term, high-magnitude impacts, uh, stresses, long-term, low-magnitude. But these do come together quite often, and the trademark case here is climate change. Uh, where shocks and stresses combine for the worst of both worlds, which is long-term high magnitude impacts, which is very much the sort of development realities we live in today. Furthermore, we also see this apply to the complexity of subjects themselves, right? So a recognition of social and social ecological complexity in the systems that we try to measure. And this encompasses quite a vast uh, intersectionality of dimensions, if you will. So if you, you go through this literature and, you know, there, there are issues on, on gender combined with, you know, different geographies, different industrial sectors, agricultural sectors, uh, there's very much a recognition, uh, a reckoning with, or at least attempts to uh, reckon with the complexity of these development subjects involved in, in a very complicated climate situation today. But, um, and sorry, I should have mentioned this before. The, the, the basic construct for this, why I'm pointing out these different definitions, these different puzzles or challenges, and these different methods is, you know, with all this talk about resilience paradigm, the basic thinking was, well, if everyone says it's a paradigm, why not ask if it actually is, right? Because the person who coins paradigms is Thomas Kuhn. So this is basically following Thomas Kuhn's framework for what defines a paradigm in social science. Well. Kuhn wasn't a fan of the application in social science, but we can talk about that later. Uh, so are there shared premises, definitions? Are there shared puzzles, problems? And are there shared methods for resolving those questions at hand? And when it comes to the methods, we see that intersectionality very much reflected in the interdisciplinarity that constitutes this resilience policy literature. Uh, so we see a whole mix of quantitative and qualitative approaches. Uh, and furthermore, we see resilience policies as a very popular subject amongst development scholars themselves, right? So this is arguably one of those cases where it's not so much that there's development knowledge and expertise going to influence policy. Arguably, this is showing a bit more of the other way around, right? So it's the development policies that are then stirring and shaping the development scholarship coming out. Um, I don't want to go so far, but you know, the, the idea of is it, you know, evidence-based policy or policy evidence-based evidence sort of comes to mind as you know the, 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 the multiple relationships at play. And this is a, a shameless pitch, but um, some of the members I've I've uh, we've we've assembled a quick policy brief uh, for COP27 this year on shedding light on resilience policy. So there there are other uh, another source for some of the contents for today's presentation. Um, and there's also this typical sort of one philosophy called begging the question, right? So there's this presumption that resilience is good and resilience ought to be the end goal without even defining resilience, right? Without actually technically explaining what constitutes resilience, how do you measure resilience, and how do you thus, you know, make meaningful conclusions, meaningful comparisons, meaningful evaluations for, say, policy efficacy. So that's just a very quick recap of some of the characteristics um, underlying the way that at least academics in development studies have spoken about resilience policy in terms of what it means, uh, what are the relevant problems, and how one might go about uh, solving them. <laughs>
So let's talk about some quick implications, right? So to what extent is this idea of re resilience actually effective for development policy? Because one of my arguments here is that there actually is no one clear resilience paradigm. I mean, you might hear this spoken of, oh, resilience policy, oh, we've got a certain resilience plan, it's climate resilient development. Yes, there are multiple variants in multiple terms, but one shouldn't presume clearly, at least from this sample, that everyone is talking about the same thing. Um, the good news, however, is that there is a very clear consensus in terms of the importance and priority of resilience, and that creates an open, inclusive space, arguably, for effective climate action. For effective international cooperation. I've, I've yet to find, and perhaps it's just a matter of time, but I've yet to find clear evidence of a government or a bo policy body saying, we are against resilience. I've seen critical scholars argue that. I haven't seen that from policy. Furthermore, on the academic side, in terms of inclusive knowledge production, it does create a space for interdisciplinary innovation. And we see a lot of examples of this sort of um, cross-disciplinary work uh, in the literature itself, perhaps one of its strengths. But it also brings a set of challenges, and I'll just emphasize four interconnected sets of challenge, challenges. Uh, first is a problem of language, right? So that basic problem of what do you mean by resilience? Um, the danger of taking the concept for granted. Uh, second is a problem of measurement, right? So whose resilience scorecard are you using? Whose resilience model are you using? Whose resilience definitions are you using? And this causes all sorts of problems in international policy when it comes to the issue of policy transfer, to the issue of commensurability. So to what extent are your resilience measurements transferable or meaningful across time and space? And is resilience uh, a cure-all, for lack of a better term? Right? I mean, development policy and development uh, you know, scholars themselves, uh, they're, they're, we, we have this tendency of sometimes jumping from one panacea to another. And I, I don't want to be too reductionist about that. I mean, there is a you know, good reason for that. But um, does resilience actually solve the problems that it sets out to solve? Uh, because arguably, resilience also contains, um, at minimum, a set of rank orderings internally in terms of what those priorities are. Uh, and quite possibly internal conflicts in terms of which aspects, which aspects of resilience take priority. A basic example for this would be social ecological resilience, where you might have competing measures and definitions of resilience, one that might emphasize the social resilience aspect, and one which might emphasize the ecological resilience aspect, right? Um, so which takes priority? And finally, Certainly in the context of global north-south relations, a problem of control. So amidst the rise of popularity of resilience policy, who's controlling these narratives? Who are the people who are defining the concept? And who are the people who are importantly creating the measurements for them? So that's a quick summary of this. Um, could I just ask quickly, am I doing all right on time or should I wrap up? Two minutes, thank you very much. So uh, I, I promised I'd give a bit of a peek into the, into the policy examples uh, beyond the more scholarly literature. So um, this is just something that I've quickly assembled just to give an idea, and it's not ASEAN, it's, it's, it's the UK in this context, but just to give an idea of how resilience policy is being used in real world contexts, right? So outside of the theoretical scholarship. So here's some, ex uh, is this, yeah, okay. Um, so here are some examples. So the UK Cabinet Office, just taking a look at how three different departments in the UK government itself are using resilience in ostensibly compatible, but substantively potentially, you know, tenuous ways. So uh, the Cabinet Office has utilized resilience um, in response to, so the big trigger in the UK context was 2007. There were uh, a, a load of some, a very big issue is summer floods in, in 2007 in the UK. And usually when problems arise at home, that's when people start taking these things very seriously. And in domestic policy contexts, that's when the UK started taking resilience very seriously. And this was integrated into domestic sector resilience plans, which then expand into sector security and resilience plans. And uh, you'll realize why I mentioned this shortly. Uh, but just 
for the time being, skipping over to the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, you see also this rise of resilience policy, but more in the context of climate resilient infrastructure. So multiple manifestations of resilience in slightly different contexts. What's interesting, however, is, well, former Department for International Development, which is now integrated in the UK under the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. What's interesting is that these domestic resilience policies are now being packaged and exported as part of UK technical assistance abroad, right? So the domestic expertise, the domestic experience of how to implement resilience policy following those 2007 floods over the past 10 years or so are now an integral part of what's this year's latest UK international development strategy promotes as part of the UK status as a world or a global superpower in science and technology. Right? And this is a case where resilience is a key part of technical assistance. So this opens up some potential concerns in terms of compatibility, in terms of measurement, in terms of control, in terms of what the actual contents of resilience policy are. And I'm, I'm not you know, suggesting that you know, there are nefarious or you know, bad motives here at all. What I'm pointing out is that even within a national context, you find multiple policy orientations. Now, when you combine that with intergovernmental attempts, you can imagine the exponential amount of complexity and potential conflicts that can arise. So I'll just close um, uh, with the bit that I was intending to arrive at with the paper, which I'm only now working on now, uh, unfortunately, which is really to take a look at what this means then for regional multilateralism. Uh, so if we go one step further from domestic challenges of coordinating resilience policy, and then moving towards the international, or at least on the regional level, uh, regional coordination of resilience building policies, what sort of challenges arise? And arguably that emphasis on complexity, on risk, on the unknown unknowns is a strong value add, as well as the global consensus that it's, it's enjoyed, uh, but albeit with a number of challenges as, as I've mentioned. So I'll just, close with these two papers that have come out this year, uh, including our, our chair, which, which very much comments on actually these issues and form some of the foundations of what I spoke about today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Albert. That was brilliant. Uh, I'd like to now invite our next speaker, George Quist, who is a final uh, year PhD student completing at the Centre of Development Studies, the University of Cambridge. And the title we have, though, of course, as Albert says, it might change, a financial straitjacket Côte d'Ivoire's National Development Plan. George, over to you. Great. Thank you, Prof. Fennell. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my presentation is still titled A Financial Straitjacket, um, Côte d'Ivoire's National Development Banks. Um, so this will look at the effectiveness of development cooperation uh, through the lens of enterprise financing, specifically in Africa and how that has evolved um, over the decades. Uh, it's part of my PhD. Uh, it's been published uh, two months ago in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Um, so I'll present a little bit of theory and a little bit of empirical evidence um, regarding this particular study. So I guess what motivated my focus on development cooperation through enterprise financing is basically captured in this graph. Um, which looks at financial inclusion in Africa, and it presents a very contrasting narrative. So financial inclusion has been a very hot topic uh, in African affairs for the past uh, two to three decades. And as you can see, there has been an effort to increase financial inclusion. So the red line shows that there has been an increase in the number of commercial bank branches uh, on the continent. So people do have more access right, to bank accounts, um, to loans, to financial services. Uh, however, there is quite a paradox, because on the one hand, you do have this increasing financial inclusion, uh, but on the other hand, right, domestic credit to enterprises has actually stagnated or even decreased in that time period. So how can we, on the one hand, have increased access to consumer loans, but on the other hand, have stagnating or even decreasing access to enterprise loans? So that particular, I guess, paradox, right, slash tension is what motivated me to study this particular topic. And this is further shown by the World Bank Enterprise Survey. So just focus on the last column in the red circle. 
and it shows that firms in Africa are the most likely to identify lack of financing as a major constraint um, to growth. So what we saw previously is confirmed in the World Bank Enterprise Surveys. Which begs the question, uh, why are African firms struggling to access credit? And there are many reasons. So African financial sectors are dominated by banks. Um, these banks are privately owned. These banks are oftentimes foreign owned. And obviously, banks care the most about profits. And so for a bank that's lending to individuals, they're more profitable either giving right, house loans, consumer loans, as opposed to lending to enterprises, which are riskier, which might pay back in a longer time period. Uh, and so that you know, focus on making profits, maximizing profits, makes banks less keen right, to lend um, to corporations. Um, foreign bank presence also plays a role because banks that are foreign don't have a nationalist fiber in that particular country. So they're more likely to lend to foreign corporations, which again, are deemed to be more credible um, in their eyes. And actually, studies show that foreign banks that are operating in Africa are actually the most profitable in the world. So if you're making profits, buying government bonds, right, giving a mortgage for a house, what have you, why would you then you know, waste your money lending to enterprises? There's no rationale to do so, at least on a financial standpoint. So this financing gap has led to conversations surrounding trying to bring the state back in in development finance. So both the states, right, bilateral donors, right, the IFIs, and trying to increase access to enterprise financing um, for firms uh, on the continent. And this has been achieved primarily, at least historically, um, through national development banks. So as opposed to the MDBs like the World Bank or the AFDB, these are state-owned banks. So for example, we have KFW in Germany, uh, and these banks are tasked with providing long-term financing to enterprises to promote national development plans. Uh, these banks were quite active uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, and they played a huge role in providing long-term financing um, to enterprises. However, they're oftentimes criticized because of corruption uh, and graft, which means that oftentimes people recommend right, to not rely on these banks and to instead rely either on private banks or on markets. But as we saw right, in the first two bullet points, private banks are not keen um, to lend. So the question is, how can we bring the state back in, and how can NDBs actually play a transformational role around the continent? And oftentimes, these development banks are financed right, through bilateral donors, such as KFW, right, MDBs like the World Bank. So that's kind of an aspect of development cooperation insofar as bilateral donors, multilateral donors, actually oftentimes provide funding for these banks to accomplish the developmental mission. So my main argument is that corruption, yes, is a factor, um, but it's not the end all be all, right? Corruption is not an African thing, it happens in the West as well. And insofar as you're willing and able to, you can actually tackle corruption if you want to. And ironically, banks are actually less likely to be corrupt because they have to follow particular prudential ratios and statements. So if corruption is found out, it actually will affect the ability to raise money. So of all the other state entities, NDBs actually are the least likely right, to at least have widespread corruption um, be publicized. So my main argument in my PhD is that there are a set of ideological and material barriers that are shaped by international financial and monetary asymmetries, which makes these development banks in Africa right, either unwilling or unable to accomplish the developmental mission. That's kind of my little theoretical framework uh, in a chart over to the right. So you can see the NDBs at the front, and they basically interact with different actors. So we have right, central banks, right, depositors, right, the IFIs, uh, bilateral donors, right, government and rating agencies. And again, these are very much shaped by these asymmetries in which global north actors right, have a lot of power right, over global south actors. For example, right, we have a monetary hierarchy in which the US dollar ends up dominating. And so if you need to import products for an enterprise, you need to have US dollars usually, and that's oftentimes provided by international donors, so either bilateral or multilateral. And so that in itself constrains the ability of these banks to operate because they do require assistance right, from foreign actors in order to be able to lend right, to enterprises. So there is an asymmetric relationship right, between, I guess, Right, NDBs, which are locally based, right, and bilateral donors, and the IFIs tend to be based um, in the global north. So 
To illustrate this, I will take the example um, of Cote d'Ivoire, which is a country in West Africa. It's one of Africa's fastest growing countries, and they have strong industrial ambitions. So it's the world's largest cocoa producer. Um, it's the world's largest cashew producer. Uh, it's in the top 10 in cotton. But this is often exported in the raw format. So they're trying to basically finance enterprises right, to process the cocoa right, into cocoa powder and chocolate, process cotton into textiles, and process raw cashews into cashew nuts. But that requires financing and money. And a lot of locally owned firms oftentimes complain of the lack of credit to allow them to grow. Uh, which begs the question, right? How are these NDBs actually able to support local enterprises in the country? And the answer is they're not able to for many reasons. So the first reason I will look at is the legacy of a colonial currency, which is actually a product of development cooperation in very insidious ways. Um, I will then look at the pressure from you know the IFIs, but also bilateral and multilateral donors to actually change the nature of state banking which also makes it difficult for these banks to accomplish um, their mission. So on to the first point. Uh, I won't look too much at how the currency works because it's not a monetary policy lecture, but Cote d'Ivoire is in the CFA franc zone. Um, are you familiar with it vaguely? Yes, no, somewhat. So it used to be used by the former French colonies, uh, established by the French governments to increase integration between the metropole right, and the colonial territories. Uh, but it's now used by 14 countries, so quite broadly used in Africa. It's currently fixed to the euro, right? previously the French franc, and that exchange rate guarantee is done through by the French government, right through the ECB, uh, which allows for this fixed parity to operate. Now, the benefit of the CFA franc actually helps control inflation because of the fixed parity to the euro. That's a good thing, especially in these very inflationary times. Um, on the other hand, it does, I think, right, blunt the channels of credit creation because in order for the French to guarantee the exchange vulnerability, right, the French government, until recently, had asked CFA countries to store half of their reserves right, in France, which means that, in essence, money that could be used to lend to enterprises right, in foreign currency is actually used to maintain the exchange rate stability, which, in my opinion, is not conducive to development. It does control inflation, but it's not a good way to actually provide uh, loans to, to enterprises. So in this particular system, I argue that actually corruption is more likely, not less likely, because if you have to have these reserves right, stored up in an account in a foreign country, when crises do occur, you're not as readily able to access that funding and so what happened, for example, in the 80s, is that when the debt crisis happened, the reserves were empty, uh, these countries lacked monetary autonomy, so they actually ended up stealing money from the NDBs right, in order to finance their government spending. So in that sense, right, cooperation right, was achieved, but you had money from donors right, going to NDBs but being stolen by governments because they were not able to find money right, elsewhere. So you have that material constraint in terms of development finance. Um, there's also a more ideological constraint, which is also tied to cooperation. So the CFA central banker is actually trained by French staff who are then trained by IMF staff. So again, development cooperation. But keep in mind that there's a difference in priorities, or there should be in my opinion, between central bankers right, in the global north and those in the south. Right, whereas global north bankers are very much bent on keeping prices stable, I, I do believe that historically at least, central banks have played a very important role in trying to promote credit creation. So by having the priorities of the global north right, through corporation influence global south central bankers, right, there is an ideological barrier insofar as these bankers are so bent on keeping prices stable that they're not able to actually lend that precious foreign exchange right, to potential enterprises in a, that try to grow and upscale um, their operations. And that's kind of materialized in looking at the reserves, right, in both CFA zones. Just look at the line going up. So the line that's across is, I guess, the limits where you don't want to be below. As you can see, the reserves in both zones, at least until 2017, are far above that limit, which again shows that the central bankers are very much prioritizing, right, keeping prices stable, right, hedging against macroeconomic risk at the expense of actually promoting right, credit creation. 
So again, from material barriers that are very much underpinned by ideological barriers, which are the product of development by a corporation, uh, but in relatively insidious ways, in my opinion. So let's look at this graph. It shows that lending trends in Cote d'Ivoire uh, focus on the solid black line, which looks at uh, credits to the private sector. So as you can see, it was very, well, it was higher in the 60s and 70s compared to the current era. And that was because there were very strong and active NDBs right, in Cote d'Ivoire, which were financed, again, by the World Bank, by the IMF, by KFW, which provided long-term loans right, to allow enterprises to flourish. That crisis happened, there was a change in discourse uh, in trying to separate the states from development. So these NDBs were either closed right, or privatized. And cooperation in terms of bilateral donors and the MDBs have been less willing to provide that precious foreign exchange, right, either grants or aid or loans right, to these banks to allow them to actually finance enterprises. So that's why ever since the debt crises, there really hasn't been a recovery of credit to the private sector that was experienced right, at a time when cooperation was actually more effective, in my opinion, in promoting development uh, in the country. So again, cooperation has changed. On the one hand, I think it was more effective for my particular study in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, nowadays, it's a little different. Oops. Okay, so. This is a graph that looks at disbursements of Cote d'Ivoire's remaining development bank. So there were four or five in the past and they were either closed or privatized. So only one is left. And if you look at the bank's you know, loans over the years, it doesn't look that developmental, right? The focus tends to be on right, consumers, right, real estates, um, and not so much on manufacturing uh, and agriculture. Um, disclaimer, I believe that industrial policy is the way to development, and so that's why I think that you know, these lending patterns are not very conducive right, to being developmental. And the reason is because, I mean, these banks don't actually have a lot of long-term support from you know, the donor community, uh, again, either through concessional loans or through grant money, and so they don't have enough resources right, to productively help enterprises. Well, they have to focus on shorter term ventures, right, that are more profitable, but again, tend to go at the expense of promoting industrial development in the country. So again, right, banks, real estate, consumer loans at the expense of manufacturing uh, and agriculture, which are the levers for structural transformation, right, in Cote d'Ivoire, but also in the world, broadly speaking, if you look at history. So conclusion um, is that you know, development cooperation presents both right, ideological opportunities, but also barriers, as well as material chances and barriers. Um, but from what I can see, there is what I can call a financial right, and monetary straitjacket right, that hinders development. Um, I also tapped into the geopolitics of right, coercion, right, co-optation, and ideological influence right, through knowledge production. So what's a good central bank? Right? What's good monetary policy? Right, what's the state's role in promoting development, uh, which for me is arguably a bigger issue right, than corruption, because corruption, again, if states are willing to, not always the case, but it can be addressed. These broader social constraints are not easily addressed by the states, and so people end up being trapped in a system that even if they wanted to, right, it's very hard to, to escape. So my call, right, my PhD, and in this talk, is to try to recenter Right, the role of foreign aid and cooperation into one that's very much right, state-centric, but also productivist insofar as there needs to be more provision right, of loans and grants right, to these banks in order for them to be able to lend to enterprises, which should then lead to economic development. Again, education is important, right? health is important as well, but historically, we have seen that the main driver of growth, transformation, and high-income status right, is through manufacturing and industrial policy. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. That was a very powerful presentation. And I'm looking forward to all the questions from the audience. But before we move on to asking to that, our last but not least um, speaker, Dr. Noura Wahabi, who is Assistant Professor of Public Policy and Administration at 
American University, AUC in Cairo. Nora, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fennell. Um, I hope everybody's uh, doing well in the room. Thank you so much for putting together this great space. Um, so I know it's uh, the last presentation, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, so just to dive straight in, my presentation today looks at one aspect of my PhD research uh, that I did at the Cambridge Development Study Center as well. Um, in my PhD, I studied the political economy of processes that produce, maintain, and contest water uh, in Egypt and, uh, and in Cairo in particular, and looking specifically at urban water, so uh, taking, uh, taking a different look than, than Reka's earlier presentation. Um, and I looked specifically at two settlements, an informal area and a residential elite area in, on desert, desert land in, in Cairo. And what I want to discuss today is the ways in which the technopolitics of water governance is being constructed, not just by the ethos of the state and donors and aid corporations, but also in the everyday practices that cut across both informal and formal areas uh, in the urban uh, settlement. Um, and this ties into the creation of inclusive knowledges that this panel is uh, speaking to. So I will present how these everyday practices shape and are, are also shaped by commodification and corporate